Howdy, I am Don Carson, I'm a concept illustrator and designer, and so my job is usually I'm brought in a project uh, just about the time the client really doesn't know what they want and they're pretty sure they don't know what it looks like and my job is to decide what that looks like through drawings. And, um, and when I was asked to uh, speak at uh, UX Week, I actually asked Jesse whether or not he was sure he, I was what he was looking for and he said yes, so here goes. Uh, my, uh, my background, I went to the Academy of Art College in San Francisco in the early 80s, and that time period was about when, um, I think most of my instructors came from the golden era, era of illustration, so we were basically trained to go out there and either be Norman Rockwell or uh, um, Al Parker, and uh, we were launched into the, uh, a world where illustration really wasn't being used as much as it used to be, it was before Photoshop, but uh, uh, we had a lot of wonderful storytelling skills, and uh, not a whole lot of venues for, uh, for showing them off. I, um, when I think back to uh, being an illustrator in illustration class, uh, there was one moment that was kind of the mind-blowing moment that, where something came up which it kind of set the rest of my career in a, in a direction. And that was, um, we had a substitute teacher in illustration too. He came in, he didn't know what the curriculum was for the day, so he said, I'm just gonna talk about arrows and, pathway and, arrows and pathways in illustration. And so he used this painting by uh, Howard Pyle, and N.C. Wyeth, sorry, N.C. Wyeth. This is an illustration of Blind Pew from uh, Treasure Island. He, um, Blind Pew uh, delivers the black spot to Billy Bones and at the, the Benbow Inn, and then he stumbles out of the Benbow Inn and he is struck down by a carriage uh, on the road. When N.C. Wyatt decided to illustrate uh, Treasure Island, he decided rather to do the obvious thing, which was to depict the, the carriage and Blind Pew about to be hit by it, he decided to give the audience the viewpoint from the carriage itself. So. Um, there are a lot of techniques I had learned in illustration prior to this particular class that talked about ways in which you could compose a painting that caused people to look in various places. One of the things you can do is you can actually make it the lightest thing in an image and that will draw your attention. Well, in this case, he's made um, the Bembo in the brightest thing, so that's not drawing your attention. The other thing that you can do is you can actually make it a, like a cool painting and put the, the, the focus area, uh, uh, make it the warmest thing in the painting. Well, the ground is the warmest thing in this particular image. So uh, the last thing you can do is you can actually have people empathize with the eyes of the character. Well, Blind Pew has a blindfold, so there's no, there's no necessarily empathizing with him because his eyes are covered, so, and yet, um, he does a marvelous job of causing your eyes to look exactly where he wants you to look. And the way he does that is by every single line in the, in the drawing is pointing to his face. It's kind of like water going down a drain. Uh, you, can, you can meander the image through the image, but you always end up on his face and empathizing with that sort of moment. And by reading the story in conjunction with this illustration, you have a real feeling for the, that moment right before he's been struck. When, um, when I was leaving, uh, the academy, the head of the department asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up and what I wanted to do when I left the academy. And I said, you know, honestly, I really don't particularly care to do finished paintings. I really like just doing the roughs. And I said, is there a job where I can do nothing but do the roughs? And she said, absolutely not. <laughs> so, uh, so I launched into the world and, and, and I have, I'm living proof that you actually can have a career doing nothing but roughs. Um, and I also had a portfolio that pretty much looked like all my peers who were leaving. We all had the same assignments, so our portfolios looked the same, and people would bemuse the fact that we were just another academy student because our portfolios looked identical. So I had no work and lots of time, so I decided, well, why don't I use all these skills that I've just learned and make a project for myself, just for the heck of it. Basically create my, my, my own master's program. So I decided, well, I like Disneyland. My grandmother lived in, an, near Anaheim, and we used to visit twice a year. So why don't I do a book of illustrations of the attention to detail that you find in a Disney theme park. I was a big fan of, uh, Warren, of uh, Rian Portfleet's work. He did uh, Gnomes. He also did uh, Dutch Treat and a lot of other books. And I thought I would do a book like that, a sketchbook of the details of Disneyland. Um, I was honored that they uh, flew me down to talk to the, the, the publishing folks. Um, but I realized as soon as I arrived at 21 years old that they mainly just wanted to get a good look at me because who on earth would do 150 paintings of Disneyland with no help? chance in the world of them ever being published. So uh, we went through about two years of trying to see whether there was a publisher interested, and there wasn't. So I ended up with a lot of paintings of Disneyland that did not become a book. Um, 
but it did broaden my portfolio, and it also helped establish a style that I have today. Um, I did get a job, a non-illustration job, as the design director for the uh, Living History Center, which did the Renaissance Pleasure Fairs in Northern California and Southern California. And I was able to apply sort of the illustration skills, but I also was doing an environmental design uh, 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 job from my illustrations for the Disneyland Park. They figured, well, he knows how to design environments, so let's give him the job of the Renaissance Fair. And so uh, my job was not so much to, to necessarily design for the public. My job was to convince 4,000 participants to all build things that look like it came from Elizabethan England. And we all had very, very small budgets, and we pretty much were building everything out of plywood and hay bales, and we had to recreate Elizabethan England out of plywood and hay bales. Um, I also had needed the, I had the job of trying to describe to these participants what it was they were trying to fake. So describing the method of waddle and daub to try to tell them when you put the bender boards on the plywood and age the plywood, you're attempting to create a construction method from England uh, when, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Um, but another thing that I, I ran into, this very much like the Blind Pew uh, illustration, was that there's something that Walt Disney called uh, the finding the weenie, or where's the weenie. And, uh, He's famous for that because when he said the weenie, he meant like the carrot. When he's talking about um, what is the thing that's going to draw me through a space, the Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland is a perfect example, is that I'm in Main Street, but I'm being drawn to the next thing based on the fact that there's something at the end of the road for me to, to go towards, and that all other things are secondary to it. Their job is to draw you to that next place. Um, the other thing it does is it allows you to to have a mental map of the environment you're in. So we started playing with that with the Renaissance Fair. Um, most of the fair is built by the participants, the stages, and the uh, crafts booths. But we were able to design into it little areas that would allow people to remember where they were, uh, that drew them from one area to the next, that suggested some sort of um, th theme for the area. And, um, and after doing that for several years, and after about six years of nagging Disney incessantly, I was hired by uh, Walt Disney Imagineering as a show designer uh, in the early 90s. And uh, my first job was to, uh, was to, to spend two and a half weeks adding a little extra details to Splash Mountain for Walt Disney World Florida. And the two and a half weeks turned to two and a half years as we realized that we had to pretty much redesign the entire thing from scratch. The, uh, the flume width had changed from Disneyland, which changed pretty much everything. Um, very much like the Renaissance Fair, I spent most of my time describing to a team of about 300 people the construction methods of human beings and critters. So human beings have rulers and straight edges. Uh, critters have teeth. So whether we were building something that a critter would build or something that a, a, but a human would build, it was a juxtaposition of those two architectural styles that, that established uh, the Splash Mountain. And I found myself designing not only buildings, but also uh, show ride interiors, guiding artists who were sculpting the, the ride through models, rock work sculptors who would, who would eventually build the cages that would become the mountain, and then actually being in the field and placing figures and art directing uh, the color painting of the finished scenes. Um, one of the marvelous things about Imagineering is that, uh, and it's fairly unique, to, uh, to that organization. I've worked with lots of other companies. Um, once that concept is done, there is, there's not a whole lot of people getting in the way of making it be anything other than what that initial intent was. So on the left, there's this concept sketch of, very rough concept sketch of this sort of critter built well. And in the field, you see that sort of wire lath uh, version of it. They put a scratch coat on it, just to, like you're doing in the inside of your swimming pool, and then they do a finish, uh, finish sculpt. Um, the scratch coat was done before I went to lunch, and when I came back from lunch, like maybe three hours later, it was a long lunch, uh, they had already sculpted the, uh, the sculpted version, and they did everything they possibly could to make it look as much as possible, like the, the, uh, the concept sketch. While I was also working on that, while that was under construction, I was brought into a team that's job was to answer uh, a, uh, a question that mo many, many guests asked at Disneyland, which was, where was Mickey Mouse? Where does he live? We needed to build a place where Mickey Mouse lived. And so we suggested building a town where he lived. And uh, we thought really early on that um, 
it'd be pretty simple to, to design a town where Mickey would live because there's all these Disney shorts. We would just reference all the architecture that was in those shorts and build them. What we found out really quickly was that the only thing Goofy about Goofy's house was that Goofy lived in it. Otherwise, they were sort of uh, bungalows in Pasadena that he would destroy over the course of the cartoon. And then the other reference we had was the uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit movie. And in that particular case, Toontown was a really kind of scary, dangerous place where humans die if they go there. <laughs> and so uh, we were trying to find the nice balance between, between uh, anthropomorphic struct architecture, uh, fun, uh, and, and not danger. Um, originally, we had thought that we would have the buildings be all rubbery and move and have big googly eyes, but we found we would be terrifying the actual audience that we were intending on ent entertaining. Um, and that, so that job was, was about trying to anthropomorphize architecture without putting googly eyes in it, make the, everything look soft, and then come up with kind of a physics that determined how these buildings would live and breathe. And the best one that I came up with at the time was it was like filling, filling a, a milk carton with air that it would it would expand, but it would continue to look like a milk, milk carton, or if you suck the air out, it would squish, but it would still look like a milk, cart, milk carton. The buildings all had that as part of its, uh, its uh, philosophy. One of the very, very early first sketches I did was of Mickey's house, which then went through many, many iterations through many artists, and I just out of, I mean, tired, tiredness, we ended up falling back on the original, original sketch, and this is what we ended up building. Um, I'm actually quite amazed and honored that it's still considered the, the house Mickey lives, whether it's in toys or games. Um, and uh, similarly to the uh, Roger Rabbit uh, cartoon spin, um, the, the concept sketch looks a whole lot like the finished product. And there was about two years between the, the sketch and the finish, and that entire process with those 300 people was to get it as close as possible to that. Um, uh, because we were building architecture but that, that defied all the laws of architecture, uh, we ended up doing concept uh, re elevations as well as um, uh, 3D models. So we would do concept sketches that showed what it would feel like, very, very rough. Then we would do elevations that were cartoony. And then those would um, eventually become the finished product. But it would uh, first be sculpted in uh, a, four, a four pound foam that was like, I think one inch to the foot and colored, and these became references that were even brought to the field and held in the hands of the contractors who were bending the lath and applying the plaster directly to the buildings. Um, and like, just like the other one, the, the, the sketches and the finished product look really, really close. Um, I continued working there. Um, I worked at Imagineering for six years, and I did a lot of, some of my favorite work was doing enhancement work, which was existing parks or smaller new parks where we would do vignettes of different themed areas that then would go off and, and uh, be built. Uh, this was for a uh, penny cr crushing machine that's in uh, uh, Adventureland in uh, Disneyland. And uh, we would do everything from bird's eye sketches. And a bird's eye sketch is any sketch that looks basically like the Disneyland map. What's great about bird's eye sketches is that they speak to everyone. Uh, when you do a sketch that's at eye view, sometimes you run into people, it's like, I don't understand how to relate to that. But there's kind of a dollhouse mentality when you look at a Disneyland map, and that is you, you project yourself into that environment. So sometimes you could do 50 vignette sketches that no one completely understands or necessarily wants to fund, but you do one bird's eye sketch and everybody gets it and they're happy to continue going on with it. Um, more uh, concept sketches for vignettes and, and, and a vignette could be anything from a kiosk to a merchandise shop to a, to a t-shirt vending thing to garbage cans. So um, in the middle of the 1990s, my son was born and my wife and I decided we didn't necessarily want to stay in LA. And so uh, we moved up to Oregon and uh, the theme park industry pretty much said, well, if you leave Los Angeles, I, don't, I just can't imagine we would ever use you again. So I had to, I had to try to figure out what I was going to do with my life since I'd now become a theme park designer and I wasn't going to be doing theme parks anymore. And a game came out, uh, I think in 1992, called Mist. And uh, we bought our first colored monitor Mac. And I, as we were wheeling it out of the store, I said, "Is you have anything on here that could make this colored monitor look good? So he threw Mist in. And I realized, my god, this is what I do. It's just it's in a computer. So I marched into the computer game industry with this idea that I was going to do theme parks for games. Um, 
unfortunately, the, the industry wasn't ready for theme parks for games yet. And so I spent uh, the next couple of years doing everything I could to sort of introduce myself to you know, color palettes that are 256 colors and, you know, and really, really low-end computers. Um, and always trying to, b to bring that sense of, of place that, I, that bird's eye map kind of quality uh, to it so that people could understand and navigate through it. And, um, and whenever possible, when I was given an interface, I always tried to make it a place, mainly because that's something I understood. So very often it was 3D, very often it was a building, and you would click on elements within it to take you into the various parts of the game. Um, I'd written an article for Gamma Sutra. Uh, I was kind of frustrated that we had these two industries, the theme park industry and the computer game industry, which, as far as I was concerned, were basically doing the same thing. They were both building 3D places. One just happened to be virtual. And out of that frustration, I wrote a long article for Gamma Sutra. And a guy named Will Harvey, who was starting a company called There.com, called me up and said, I think you need to work for us. And uh, he, um, his dream was to create a planet, a virtual planet, where you could go, anybody from around the world, you would have an avatar. And if you were on the beach and your friends said they were going to meet you on the beach, you'd meet, meet on that very same beach. Um, we sort of naively ran into that. Uh, uh, we'd pulled back a little bit as we were designing. We started out with an island that was kind of tropical themed. And then my job was to kind of bring the, the, that same sort of theme park idea of a sense of place to these virtual places. So we began with the bird's eye sketches, we, vignettes for individual elements uh, that would appear in it. Um, Storylines, we didn't necessarily want people running around shooting at each other, but we sure did like shooting at people. So we uh, came up with this idea that you would be firing fruit back and forth at people rather than bullets. And so we had this whole mythology about this race of monkeys that they, they threw fruit at you. So uh, um, also the idea too that every building had an individual story very much like everything in a theme park would. Uh, so there was uh, unique theming for each structure. There was a storyline behind it. This is Lucky's Bar. It was a complex with a bar in the center of it and a big hole in the roof. And, uh, and also this is Tiki, Tiki Pete's shirts. The idea also that you, would, uh, you could be walking on the beach somewhere and you'd see someone's Hawaiian shirt and say, boy, I sure like that Hawaiian shirt. Where'd you get it? And they'd say, Tiki Pete's. And then you would have to trudge all the other side of the island to get, to get it. The idea that, that purchasing something was environmentally based gave you a reason to, to fly there on your jetpack or run there in your, in your, in your buggy. Um, what we discovered fairly, fairly quickly was that uh, we were shooting for a market of people who had computers that were probably not as powerful as gamers would have. And so we had to really downsize uh, our expectations as to how unique these elements were going to be. So while we originally designed this uh, you know, Lucky's bar with this giant tiki gob, which of course crushed and killed Lucky. Um, and the reason it crushed him was because he was a collector of, of the ill fates of other people. So there's like the, uh, there's like the steering wheel from Gilligan's Minnow and you know, shark teeth and sunken ships and bottles. Um, and we had to rethink environments so that we were using this few polygons as absolutely possible and we're using pieces as much as possible. So then for the next two years, we, we built this product around the idea that one could create a sense of place with as few polygons as you can imagine. Um, also, you would multi-purpose environments. So if you had built a bar or a pub, you could uh, repurpose it and come up with another theme that basically used the same geometry with maybe one or two other elements that were slightly different. And also the idea of navigating, very much like you would navigate through Disneyland, through posters and icon iconic wayfinding that would cause you to be interested in areas you hadn't been basically by the, the in-world graphics. We did get some originality into it. In this case, it's Lucky's Bar turned into Lucky's Tours, which of course had another ill fate. And the environment that that was set in was uh, strewn with, all, was actually built out of all the parts that fell out of or are broken from the ship. And uh, you can see the lower poly, but we we're still attempting to create a sense of place. So. Uh, by today's standards, uh, there.com was very, very rudimentary. Uh, our goal was to, to, to create color and, um, and a sense of texture that determined one place from another. So super, super simple buildings, lots and lots of color. And my job was filled with drawing every single rock and twig and ladder and hoop and sign. 
And this is where our wayfinding turned into and we, we moved away from the, the having to, to drive all the way across the island to get that shirt from Tiki Pete's and we created a catalog system and also the ability to click on these posters that would actually te teleport you th to those locations. So that's basically what it would look like in the product. And then we, we had this entire graphics uh, package that was all about how one advertises in this virtual environment, um, virtual beverages. And one of the things we discovered was there was a tremendous market in uh, the sale of virtual clothing. Uh, Will Harvey left uh, there and started a company called IMVU or MVU.com, which has just celebrated nine years. And I work as uh, my day job is working as their art director. And uh, they um, they basically took, stripped away the the island part of the experience, and they built a catalog where people from all over the world can dress up their avatars. We have over 20 million products in the catalog. Most are built by the, 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 the customers. Um, my job was to build 3D environments that were, well, the, the previous product was about exploring these environments. These environments are purely context for connection. So you would appear in this coffee shop and have a conversation that would be inspired by the environment you were in. And the, the goal was to make each environment as diverse as possible to con conceivably connect with different customers. And also, it was meant to uh, inspire our member developers to ex have high expectations of what their products need to look like. Um, still fairly low polygon, because it needs to run on lots of different computers. That's the Martha Stewart environment. <laughs> and so while I've been doing that, I've also been freelancing on weekends and whenever I can get jobs on the side. And I've sort of been, been I can, that, that threat to never use me again in the theme park industry only lasted about a year. And I've been basically working with pretty much all the theme park companies as well as game companies. And I've been applying the things that I've learned in these virtual environments to the, the way in which that I communicate to my clients. So while in the past I might have done illustrations and drawings to communicate to them, now I'll actually build a 3D model and texture it. Uh, for me, um, the, especially since I live remotely and I'm not always necessarily invited to the, the meeting where they will misinterpret my work, I, um, <laughs> I, I want the thing to be to scale. And I want you to have an understanding of how it might be lit. Now granted, once it gets out of my hands, I'm not allowed to participate. And sometimes four or five years later, I get to ride the ride and find out what got in and what didn't get in. But I know that when I send them the model that the architects will understand, the engineers will just understand, and the creative people will understand. So uh, although there's a whole ton of stuff I can't show because of, of non-disclosure, um, constantly trying to mix this idea of concept being, being enjoyable and also informative. Um, Sometimes it means that I over-deliver, so I might be hired to do a, a traditional illustration, but I'll also deliver a SketchUp model or a 3D Max model. And uh, although the creative folks may not even open the file, if it gets in the hands of the engineers or the architects, I know that they're going to understand and be able to interpret it and plug it into their work. Um, and I also will do it when I, I do a lot of bird's eye illustration is one of the things that I do a lot of. Uh, this is for the Dickens Christmas Fair, which is held in the Cow Palace every year near San Francisco. This was for their, their bird's eye map. Of their, their, and I just, it was just easier for me to build it in SketchUp real fast and render it. And then I just apply tracing paper to it and then do a more illustrative illustration over the top of it, which, which retains the fun but, um, but doesn't, uh, doesn't you know, look stiff like the, the 3D model. Okay, come on, there we go. And uh, here's an example of a, an entire land for a theme park project. Uh, sometimes I'll just do, do this. This will, this will be what I produce. It'll go off, it'll be used, it'll change. Sometimes I'll actually throw tracing paper over it and do a full color illustration. I've worked on a whole bunch of various projects on various degrees, um, whether it's just window designs or it's layout. Um, there's a lot of the wonderful theme park stuff happening out there. Asia is a fantastic market. It's growing like crazy. And uh, recently, I worked on uh, the, uh, the early, early concepts for the, uh, the storybook circus for uh, Fantasyland Walt Disney World, which opened recently. And uh, in this particular case, I uh, was asked to do the circus area, and I had to admit that I didn't really actually like circuses, and so that I wanted to work on designs that would be the kind of circus I would like to go to. And uh, 
I handed off the designs maybe two years ago and visited it maybe four months ago for the first time and was extremely happy with the direction that they went in. Marvelous, marvelous, fun, very colorful experience. So, so my career has been very eccentric and, uh, and I've jumped all over the place and I think what's what surprised me is that what I thought I was going to be was uh, a commercial artist, and then what I ended up being was an environmental designer. But then I ended up being a game designer who did environmental stuff, and now I'm a game designer who's now doing game pieces that are being built into theme park stuff. So I'm, I'm becoming to realize that I should never ever imagine what the trajectory of what I'm doing is going to be like. And uh, about three weeks ago, I got a hold of uh, my developer copy of the Oculus Rift. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, last year, uh, uh, a young guy created a uh, company around um, a headset that gives you uh, 3D input based upon the 3D models that you create or games. And uh, it's a really obvious no-brainer for the, th the game industry. Uh, I really am excited about using it for the design uh, process. Uh, I would say that even when I was doing those initial concept sketches, that I always had the 3D thing in my head. And uh, my, my watercolor or dye color or my ink paintings were nothing more than my plain air painting of the thing in my head. When I started doing the, the 3D models, it allowed me to actually create something to scale that I could uh, to, to, to deliver and say, no, really, it will work in the space. No, really, the lights do look good in this, uh, this arrangement. And being able to then sort of on the fly build 3D models as quickly as I would have given an illustration and sometimes deliver an illustration and a, um, uh, a finished model. Um, now I can actually deliver something fully realized in color, completely lit that you can ride or you can walk through. And one of the most amazing things uh, that's happened to me is that I can I can produce something in about a half an hour, put those goggles on, and walk around in it, know that the scale will work. And if I know that something's not working, I take them off, I make the change, I put them back on again. It means that uh, within a week of the concept, I'm riding around inside the building, I'm walking around inside the, the exhibit. And um, whether or not this is ready yet for me to plop this on the eyes of an executive, I, I doubt. But as far as me as a designer, it allows me to, to, to know that what I am building is going to work in the space and is as close as possible to the, the picture of the 3D thing in my head. And so that's pretty much it. Thank you.